For many people, if they listed words that they associated with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the word sacrifice would be one of those words. As a civil rights leader, some would say that he made the ultimate sacrifice on April 4, 1968, when he was assassinated. According to his friends who knew him in seminary school, he sacrificed the love of his life to be the man his family wanted him to be and the man that the civil rights movement needed. But if he'd had his own choice to make his own decisions and be his own man, his lady most likely would have been a white one. This one, Betty Motes. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Mess History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and comment I subscribed in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now on to why you are here. During the 1960s, Dr. Martin Luther King was already well known for what most people remember him as being, a leader in the civil rights movement. And often, when we know a person to be something, we can have a tendency to think that that's what he or she always was. Well, obviously, Dr. King wasn't born wearing a three-piece suit and giving emotionally stirring speeches. At one point, he was a child. Then he was a young man before he became the civil rights icon we know of today. And it was in his young man phase that he did what many of us did when we were young adults, tested boundaries. Many of us, when in our late teens and early 20s, were in college and for the first time away from the watchful eyes of our parents every day. And with that distance comes the freedom to find ourselves and to be ourselves. And that's just what Martin Luther King was doing when he was a seminary student attending Crozer Theological Seminary. And let his friends tell it, a big part of who he found himself to be was centered in a romance with Betty Moitz, a young white woman who was an art student and cafeteria worker. Their love affair started in 1949. And even though Martin's school wasn't in his native Atlanta or anywhere else in the South, where racial segregation was more apparent than in northern parts of the country, his friends warned him to end his relationship with Betty. Chester, Pennsylvania was not extremely segregated like the South. Public places like schools, stores, and restaurants were common places to see black people and white people together. Together but separate, that is, black couples and white couples together in the same spaces. However, interracial couples would have been an unsettling thing for people to see, even in his liberal college town. For romantic relationships, there was still a line drawn for blacks and whites. But Martin didn't care about any of that. He just wanted to be with Betty, anywhere and everywhere. Martin's father understood the nuances of the integrated North. And because of that, he disapproved of King's relationship with his white girlfriend. But he objected for other reasons too. One, King was being groomed to pastor a church and lead the budding civil rights movement. His father knew that a Martin Luther King Jr. who had a white wife would not be received well by his church or the press or the movement, which would have seen King's interracial relationship as hypocritical at best. The other reasons that King's father would disapprove of Betty was that she, even though white, was below Martin's station or social status. Martin was being groomed for something great, and a cafeteria worker simply had no place in the picture. Martin Luther King Sr. had a lot to say about his son's life and potential wife. The way he saw it, his son was destined for greatness and those plans did not include a white woman cafeteria worker, or even Coretta Scott in the beginning. King Sr.'s first choice of a wife for his son was Matilda Dobbs, an opera singer from a prominent black family in Atlanta. But that's a story for another day. So we know what Martin Luther King Jr.'s father thought about his interracial love story, 
but maybe he was just too old to understand. What about King's friends? What did they think about him and Betty? Before I go on, I can already imagine the comments. Ty, where are the rest of the pictures of Betty? Why are you only using these few? Or better yet, Ty, I googled Betty and I saw another picture. Why aren't you showing her pretty pictures and making her look all homely? And I get it. There are not a lot of photos of Betty available because she was not a public figure. And if you Google Betty Moitz, you will likely see a page that looks kind of like what I saw that repeatedly includes this woman's face. If you read articles about King's interracial relationship, specifically the one that he had in college, <clears throat> you'll likely see her face there too. Well, just to set the record straight for the sake of this woman's legacy and her family, her name is Betty Moritz, not Moitz. According to her memorial page, the love of her life was a doctor and a junior, but not Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Her husband was Dr. Edward Moritz Jr. So I promise, I'm not trying to show King's white girlfriend in a bad light. She really looked the way she looked. Now, back to King's friends. According to Reverend Pius J. Barber, who was a friend to King in his seminary days, MLK was idealistic, and the fact that he couldn't be with Betty left him, quote, a man with a broken heart. And just how did King get over his broken heart? As claimed by Reverend Barber, quote, he never recovered, end quote. King went to an older married friend named Horace Whitaker for advice about his relationship. Here's what he said about it, quote, they were very serious, although he was young. I'm not saying he wasn't mature enough for that kind of experience, but I remember talking to him about that kind of marital situation, and we had talked about it from the standpoint that if he intended going back to the South and pastoring at a local church, that might not be an acceptable kind of relationship in a Black Baptist church, and I think he would be valuing that in light of whether or not it was a workable situation knowing his own particular sense of call, end quote. Another of King's friends, Marcus Wood, said, quote, King used to go over to their house quite often to see her. I supposed he thought that, here I am out of the South now, and not back home, out in the open, nothing illegal, a free place. Sure, I can go over and talk to this white girl. King was extremely fond of her. He was also rather proud of the fact that he was able to socialize openly with a white girl." End quote. The way that this friend put it, it makes it sound as though King was just as, if not more, infatuated with Betty's whiteness than Betty herself. How do you perceive it? Let me know in the comments section. King was telling his friends that he planned on marrying Betty. To that, Marcus Wood said, they will kill you. They'll hang you up on a pole. The prejudice is too heavy in the South for a black man to marry a white woman." End quote. According to Marcus, King's response to that was, quote, This is where I'm wanted, where I'm needed. I want to tell the Southern man to wake up. It's a new day coming. End quote. Marcus also said that, quote, The more we warned ML that marriage was out of the question, especially if he hoped to become a pastor in the South, the more he refused to break off the potentially controversial relationship." End quote. Records of these conversations are what call into question King's motive for fighting. Was he fighting for the equality of black people? Or was he fighting for black men to have access to white women? So just how did Martin meet this lady who stole his heart? In the kitchen of his college campus, where Betty worked, the two struck up a conversation, and a few months later, they were a couple, dating out in the open with serious intentions for each other. Now, as for the details of the relationship between Martin and Betty, I have to credit author Patrick Parr, who really did some amazing in-depth research for his book called The Seminarian, Martin Luther King Jr. Comes of Age. He tracked down Betty after years of searching for her. Here is some of what she told Patrick Parr in their interview. 
One source says that his interview with her was the only interview she ever gave. I will admit that I saw a write-up in an old newspaper for a BBC broadcast of something called Reputations, Dr. Martin Luther King, that was said to have input from Betty. Perhaps that information was from Parr's interview as well. Either way, Betty's interview with Parr was rare, if not the only one. In it, she said, quote, We were madly, madly in love, the way young people can fall in love. I listened, and he'd just talk and talk. He was wonderful, a joy to be with and listen to. One thing that Emil knew at 19 was that he could change the world." End quote. Emil. That is what his friends and Betty called Martin Luther King Jr. Emil was as public as he could possibly be with his relationship with Betty. He wanted to take her everywhere they could be seen together. She would watch him and his friends play pool and ping pong. Sometimes they would go for drives. Other times they would just sit on a bench and talk and kiss. She said that it never occurred to her that their racial differences might cause a stir in public. She said, quote, I never noticed. I always had a tan and dark brown hair. We did go out on dates. He was always trying to get me to go with him to restaurants in Chester. I was embarrassed to let him know I had never been to any of those places. In those days, who went to restaurants?" End quote. Good question, especially for college kids without much money. But apparently, any time that King had some extra money, he wanted to use it to take Betty somewhere that they could be seen. Their relationship, like any, started out being light and fun, but eventually, Emil became serious about it as his feelings grew for Betty. He tried to figure out how their relationship could progress. To say that that would be difficult was an understatement. Away at school, he could live in a fantasy land that allowed him to believe that he and Betty would get married and live happily ever after. But in reality, he couldn't even tell his family about her. When his close sister, Christine, would visit, he would hide Betty from her, afraid that his sister would tell his mother about Betty. About that, Betty said, quote, he was worried what she'd think. In the end, we all know the decision that King made, likely with a lot of influence, shall we say, from his father. But oh, if he could have had it his way. King only spoke of Betty once publicly in the 1964 biography by Lerone Bennett called What Manner of Man. And King said, quote, she liked me and I found myself liking her. But finally, I had to tell her resolutely that my plans for the future did not include marriage to a white woman, end quote. According to King's friends, breaking that news to Betty would have been a hard thing for ML to do. And that makes sense when you think of Betty's words. Remember that she told Patrick Parr, quote, we were madly, madly in love, the way young people can fall in love. Emil and Betty dated from 1949 until 1951. Two years later, he was married to Coretta Scott. Betty died in 2016 at the age of 89. Do you know who else married a black woman when he really wanted to marry a white woman? Sammy Davis Jr. I published a video about that story that you can see here. I will also leave a link to it in the description box. My sources for this story are The Seminarian, Martin Luther King Jr. Comes of Age by Patrick Parr, mirror.co.uk, salon.com, and the Baltimore Sun Archives 2018 and 2020. Are you a content creator, influencer, or blogger who feels like your platform could use an extra boost? Are you thinking about becoming a content creator but you don't know where to start and you want to be sure that you dot all of your I's and cross all of your T's? If so, Layla Lynn can likely show you exactly what you need to get on your way. Her fun new class is called The Business of Blogging with Layla Lynn and in it she is sharing the fundamental principles of blogging in 2022. Because let's face it, 
Social media is a moving target, and what worked well five years ago is likely not what works well today. And with Layla Lynn, you're getting the information from someone who is successful at putting the principles to practice on her own social media platforms, and she literally has the credentials to back it all up as she holds degrees in social media marketing. Layla Lynn is a multiple six-figure earner whose first social media marketing course helped this channel go from earning $30 a month to earning five figures a month. I'm ready to dig in my heels and learn even more so that I can earn even more. Are you with me? If so, hit my link at the top of the description box and join her class to access this amazing, affordable advice from a woman who knows her business, the business of blogging. If you have a business, product, service, YouTube channel, or social media account that you would like to promote on my channel, email me at taiwan at taisaidwhattaisaid.com to get rates for advertising on my community tab, my live streams, and or my edited videos, just like this one. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Tai Said What Tai Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that thanks button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.